Um, we're going to get started. Um, so, this is our final session, final lecture in the series of on what the universities uh, should be. Um, but before we hear from Mark, I'd just like to take a few moments to remember Doreen Massey. Okay, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about Doreen. Doreen passed away on Friday. She was a geographer, tremendously significant one, both within her field and with that and beyond it. She was also a lifelong socialist feminist, a political activist and an influential public intellectual. She worked at the Open University, to which she remained loyal because of its accessibility to all who wanted to learn. She turned down professorships, including one from Oxford, because she considered Oxford too exclusive and elitist. She also turned down an OBE, and she wanted to find out how she could best publicise that. Um, she was act actively engaged in British politics, working with figures such as Tony Benn, Ken Livingston, and she also worked internationally, most notably in Venezuela and South Africa. I'm just going to quote now from an article published by um, Jeremy Gilbert and Joe Littler, who worked with her uh, on the journal Soundings, and they wrote, It is difficult to think of a British scholar of her stature who remained so consistently and directly engaged in immediate political activities alongside rigorous academic work. She seemed to understand better than anyone else what it means to try to make scholarly work both conceptually sophisticated and always politically relevant. She was at the forefront of the radicalisation of human geography from the 70s onwards, a pioneer both in developing approaches informed by Marxism and then in complicating these approaches with a detailed attention to the multi-dimensional nature of power, space and selfhood. She also um, gave a talk here a couple of years ago as part of the CAPE series, a talk on neoliberalism. And not only was it one of the best talks I've heard at my time in Brighton, it was incredibly lucid, engaging, impassioned, committed. But she also was one of the most generous spirited people I've ever met. Um, and, and all the obituaries you read, you hear this again and again, how kind and generous she was. And, and I only met her for one evening, very briefly, but she really was um, a lovely person. So may we follow her example. Uh, yeah, now to Mark. It's my truly great pleasure to work with Mark McGovern. Most weeks when I've said that, I've been said it through gritted teeth or been lying or had to speak in euphemisms. But it really is a true pleasure to welcome Mark. He's a good friend to lots of us on the programme and he's a friend to the programme itself. He is Professor of Social Science at the University of Edge Hill. His work is on the study of conflict and the politics of transition in post-conflict post societies, human rights and transitional justice, and the critical analysis of terrorism and political violence. More importantly, he's done crucial, painstaking and detailed analysis um, of Irish pubs. <laughs> Very soon he has a book coming out entitled States of Collusion, State violence, human rights, and transitional justice. Thank you, Mark. I should say very soon is a very elastic term. Um, in terms of, okay. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, uh, talk to you here tonight. Um, we, we were talking about it with Paul before, and uh, some of this is going to be an exercise in stating the bleeding obvious. Uh, but sometimes maybe stating the bleeding obvious is, uh, isn't a bad thing. Um, it is also more or less going to be exactly 45 minutes. So set your clocks and you won't be getting out early. That's just um, the way it'll probably work out. Um, as all of you, I am sure, are aware, as part of the 2015 Counterterrorism and Security Act passed last April, the current government has placed a statutory duty, now enforced by criminal law, upon a broad, a broad range of institutional authorities, including departments of social work, hospitals, schools, and of course, colleges and universities, that in their policies and practices, they have to have quote, due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. This is the latest uh, of the tranche of anti-terror legislation introduced since 2000, and of the prevent stream of contest, the government's overall counter-terrorism strategy. 
What I want to do this evening is to examine what I see as two distinct but potentially complementary threats posed by encroaching cultures of compliance within universities evident in and relevant to the prevent duty. In the first place, I want to argue against the stated purpose of the prevent policy that in fact the statutory duty and much of the broader field of government measures of which it forms part has little or nothing to do with preventing people being drawn into terrorism. Rather, they are means to institute a bureaucratised technology of surveillance and compliance directed primarily at the suspect community of British Muslims, predicated on a rejection of multiculturalism and the promotion of an integrationist agenda. Doing so, I want to suggest adopts a specific ideological model to explain the roots of, pol of political dissent, social alienation and critical inquiry, exemplified in the flawed conception of radicalisation, drawn from the fusion of a dominant strand of academic terrorism studies and arguments derived largely from neoconservative perspectives. This political project and form of thought underpins the logic of the prevent duty brought to bear in an assault on the university. This will form the bulk of my talk. Uh, second, I want to consider a chief concern I have as to the likely effects and outworkings of this statutory duty in the context of the market-orientated, risk-averse managerialism of the neoliberal university. I want to argue that the greatest problem we are likely to face is that the very nature of the bureaucratic order of the contemporary university will likewise promote a culture of control and compliance for students and staff in what is in what it is we are able to is in what it is we are able to say, teach, and research. In that context, too, I want to point to the considerable and politically oppressive work, the, de the deployment of apparently anodyne concepts such as risk, safeguarding, protection, and reputation do in these circumstances. Now, can I also just say from the outset that throughout, whenever I'm using the term terrorism. I'm not endorsing the analytical usefulness or conceptual validity of that term, but rather employing it solely in the context of its use by government and policymakers. I want to start, though, with what, given its ostensible purpose, might be looked upon as something quite strange, but perhaps revealing a, 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 a perhaps revealing feature of the Counterterrorism and Security Act and the duty. As anyone who knows me will tell you. I rarely have ever talked for very long without mentioning the north of Ireland, and I'm afraid tonight will prove no exception to that particular rule. Uh, because I think it is of more than passing interest that the 2015 Act and the duty do not apply to or in Northern Ireland. Now, given the duty's stated aim, this might lead one to think that the British government views the North as a haven of sanity, security and social cohesion, where there is little fear and no prospect of anyone being drawn into terrorism because of anything someone might say or do in a school, a university or a prison. Indeed, this goes further. In October 2015, framing the logic of the Counterterrorism and Security Act, the British government introduced a new counter-extremism strategy with a stated purpose, as the Home Secretary put it, of, quote, forging a partnership between government and all those individuals, groups and communities who want to see extremism defeated. This counter-extremism strategy will also not take force in Northern Ireland. Now, in part, it should be said, this is a matter of practicalities, because introducing these measures into the North would require approval by the Northern Ireland Assembly, and so the support of a party and a wider constituency of people who know only too well what it is to be treated as a suspect community. And not to put too fine a point, point on it, that's not going to happen. But what is also striking about the government's new counter-extremism initiative is the clear and I think politically significant identification of the values the strategy is taking to defend with Britishness. The, and I quote, liberty we cherish, the rights we enjoy, the democratic institutions that protect them are, according to David Cameron in his foreword to the document, our distinct British values. This echoes the 2011 Prevent Strategy's definition of extremism as, quote, vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, 
including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect, respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. In the government's eyes, in other words, extremism is therefore understood as the antithesis of values that are not so much universal as intrinsically, inherently, and distinctly, if not uniquely, British. It is a valorised vision of Britishness that leads the Prime Minister to insist it's important for everyone, in the same document, whether Sikh, Jew, Muslim, Hindu or Christian, to also see themselves, as he puts it, as a proud Brit. Now, the political significance of such ideas is cast of such an idea is cast into stark relief in post Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, where the principle of the parity of esteem, the right of any citizen to be recognised as Irish rather than British, problematizes the identification of such values as essentially British. I think I could also make a good case that know that an avowed sense of British identity and loyalty to the revered institution of the Crown, even when not advocating violence itself, has been a form of extremism, acting as a driver of loyalist violence in Northern Ireland. So too, the formerly enshrined intolerance of popery of the Orange Order, whose annual marching day is of course a public holiday. Yet even stepping away from the particular political divisions of the North, its exclusion from the prevent duty might still seem surprising. Northern Ireland, it has to be said, has seen little in the way of Islamist militancy. <laughs> but central to the official discourse of radicalisation is that it is not solely concerned with the threat from Islamism, but also very much with far-right extremism and racial hatred, something from which Northern Ireland is very far from immune. Once dubbed the race hate capital of Europe, Belfast is still home to orchestrated attacks against ethnic minority communities. And throughout the North, one of the most obnoxious dividends of the peace process has been a substantial rise of racism and racist violence. As Daniel Holder of the Belfast-based Committee on the Administration of Justice recently noted, given the extent of far-right activity and racial attacks in the North, quote, Whitehall seems strangely relaxed about not applying its flagship strategy here. Why does this matter? Perfect fact that it's about the North, and I always talk about the North. Why does this matter? Well, because beyond the bounds of Northern Ireland, it reveals something about the political project that I think is implicit in and underpins the logic of the prevent duty and its likely effects in universities. That, as with the broader prevent duty, prevent agenda of which it is an expression, it is founded on an integrationist model of Britishness designed to shape and discipline, to generate and enforce compliance in the everyday lives of a targeted population. Now I want to return to this theme later, but first I want to address something a little bit more basic. What is it that the Prevent Duty is asking universities to prevent? The first thing we should say is that it's not terrorism, or rather, at the very least we might say, that the prevent duty is entirely unnecessary if its aim is stopping terrorists or the advocacy of violence. How so? Well, first because preventing people being drawn into terrorism refers to two possibilities. That people may become involved in terrorism or that they may come to support terrorism through loosely defined terrorism related activity. Both these dimensions of being drawn into terrorism, we should note, are circumstances that lie in the future. The prevent duty is not then concerned with people who are involved in either, but with a form of pre-crime, with people who might be, in some as yet unrealised, unspecified possible future. In any case, and even more to the point perhaps, there are, there are already a plethora of laws and wide-ranging powers in place to deal with people who are involved in terrorism, realised or threatened, in promoting political violence or of other terrorist-related activity. This is, in fact, implicit in the government's prevent duty guidance for higher education institutions. The encouragement of terrorism, I quote, and the inviting of support for a prescribed organisation are both criminal offences, it notes. So universities should not provide a platform for these offences to be committed. Well, nor, in already existing law, should anyone else. And you do not need a statutory duty to enforce what is already, and in any case, criminalised. Indeed, I think we can go further. 
there are already a range of laws and international human rights standards in place to deal with some of those things taken to fall under the rubric of that problematic term, extremism, that do not in themselves constitute terrorism. You do not need a statutory duty, for example, to challenge or stop people disseminating ideas in universities based on racial hatred or incitement to racial discrimination or violence. Those laws, those offences, already exist. To say nothing of the various codes of practice that universities themselves have in place to counter discrimination and inequality. The second point is, uh, the second point is that extremism does not necessarily include supporting or advocating violence. This was, I'm going to problematize all these, some of these concepts, by the way, as we move along. Uh, but uh, the, this was the most important shift in the 2011 version of PREVENT that otherwise largely aped earlier New Labour policies and perspectives. However, the 2011 update of PREVENT identified something that it called non-violent extremism as crucial in the process of radicalisation. This was new, at least in legislative and policy terms. The uncoupling of the concept of extremism from the advocacy, never mind the practice of violence, was a vital stage in broadening the scope of ideas and actions that could be criminalised and a necessary precondition for the logic of the prevent duty. Non-violent extremism was now conceived as a loose open and potentially shifting amalgam of views on a wide range of issues with little or nothing to do with violence or terrorism. A vaguely defined ideological well of illiberalism, which in the view of the prevent duty guidance, quote, can create an atmosphere conducive to terrorism and can popularise views which terrorists can exploit. I don't think they include uh, adoration of the crown in that particular <laughs> the logical policy outcome was therefore to engage in what was termed counter-ideology work, to demand, as the then independent reviewer of a terrorism legislation, Laura Car Carlyle did, that, quote, interested organisations, including those in the student arena, be called upon to declare unequivocally that they oppose extremism. Or, as the PREVENT document itself declared, in Orwellian terms, that, this should be, that there should be, quote, no ungoverned spaces in which extremism is allowed to flourish. And what the denial of ungoverned spaces meant in practice was soon uh, trialled by the then Education Minister, author of Celsius 77 and self-declared arch neoconservative Michael Gove, who quickly established a task force of specialists on how terror networks infiltrate Britain. This task force, as the Sunday Express infused at the time, was designed to, quote, target schools that indoctrinate children with the ideology that prepares them to commit acts of terror. <coughs> the result, of course, was the Trojan horse scandal and the high-profile public allegations originating from an anonymous letter, uncritically accepted as truth, of an Islamist conspiracy to take over a number of Muslim-majority schools in Birmingham. This provided Gove, and I can't help picturing him in a canoe wearing a pith helmet at this point, with the opportunity, as he put it, to drain the swamp and not wait for the crocodiles to reach the boat. As some reports have found, uh, have found the outcome of the Trojan horse affair has been a profound chilling effect in schools and Muslim communities. The disruption of lives and careers, and indeed, if it's prevented anything, has prevented education. And this despite the fact that a series of Ofsted reports on the targeted schools found, directly contrary to what had been alleged, that there was no systematic and coordinated plot to take over these schools, or of any concerted or deliberate plot to promote radicalisation and violent extremism of Muslim children in these schools or elsewhere. As another author has recently noted, the result was also the introduction of measures whereby, paradoxically, given the liberalising government rhetoric, but tellingly, the, quote, state has entered more fully into the lives of children and families through limitless government regulations. Not least, 
where the supposed failure on the part of schools to comply with an arbitrarily administered new edict to promote British values is, again tellingly, equated with a failure to identify extremism. Perhaps the, thing of, the sign of things to come for universities. Now, the way in which ideology is conceived in the PREVENT document and the over-determining over -determin role of ideas as an explanation for social action is also important, not least for universities as places, ostensibly at least, dedicated to the generation and dissemination of and critical reflection on ideas. So too here is the notion that there is such a thing as an ideology of extremism, as David Cameron has argued, which he argues is the foundation, the driver of terrorism. Here, I think, there is a replication of the categorical and conceptual error that Bob Brecker and Mark Devenny um, uh, note uh, about terrorism. Uh, terrorism, as they argue, uh, terrorism names no political ideology, so that terrorism would be a matter of creating, inducing or spreading terror as an end in itself, rather than as a means to some other end. So too, we might say, a supposed ideology of extremism constructs extremism not as a radical version of a particular ideology, but the pursuit of extremity in and of itself. Indeed, this is precisely the conceptual space that is, I think, intended to be opened up. Because apart from anything else, the idea that people, groups, individuals and social networks pursue the extreme for its own sake also lends itself to depoliticized and psychosocial models of explanation and causation, echoing pseudoscientific storm and stress, psychologized visions of the young that constitute them as being more prone to the attraction of extremity in all things. This is, in other words, fertile ground for the dominant ways in which the process of radicalization is understood. As Aaron Kunani has argued, the very concept of radicalization emerged as the master signifier of the late war on terror, as a vehicle for policymakers to once again talk about what made political violence happen when the rhetoric of evil proved insufficient as a means of conceptualizing, justifying and implementing policy. But radicalization was conceived in such a way as to move any focus and analysis of causation away from the macro-structural level of politics, economics, of policy and foreign interventions to micro-process-based explanations from the realm of inequality and grievance to that of networks, identity, alienation and individual psychological vulnerability. <coughs> The explanatory vacuum created by the politically driven unwillingness to recognise the effects of wars abroad and injustice <coughs> at home fueled this psychologization of social problems, recasting social and cultural problems as psychological ones. Thus too, ideology and the realm of ideas became an overwhelming focus of concern, as does the alleged vulnerability of those at risk of radicalization. Powerful, disciplining concepts, already familiar in many realms of social life, are thus securitized in the name of counter-radicalization, not least in terms of the supposed antidote to vulnerability, safeguarding and a duty of care. Now, as we've seen perhaps most starkly played out in the racialized gendering of the Muslim woman in the war on terror, as alternatively sometimes simultaneously, monstrous threat and helpless victim, vulnerability ideologically legitimizes intervention. Domestically, this is built into the model of radicalization and particularly applied to the young. The vulnerable, construed in psychological terms, are thus used as prone to the potentially malign influence of social networks and subverted social bonds. Interestingly, I think, usually referred to as the bunch of guys theory. Indeed, conjuring dangerously with metaphors of sexual abuse and exploitation, the vulnerable become victims of grooming by the disseminators of extremist ideology. The regular deployment of the language of paedophilia is not, I think, coincidental. In the prevent duty, 
as applied to university students, we are seeing extended to young adulthood an, infant an infantilizing model of securitized child protection. And so in the contrived absence of being able to talk about people coming to see the world differently, radically, on the basis of the social, economic and political order that shapes their lives, two approaches to understanding and identifying radicalization therefore emerge. Cognitive radica radicalization and behavioral radicalization. It becomes what an individual might say or how, or how they may act in the everyday, other than in ways that evidence support for violence or violent acts themselves, that therefore stand as indicators of radicalization. Given the instrumental a priori assumptions at work, the focus therefore falls firmly on the body and voice of the individual as the site not only for understanding how radicalization happens, but also how it will manifest itself. The body and the voice of the individual become the object of concern for generating compliance. And it is from this, I think, trying to get into universities, um, hopefully, uh, that we end up with the rationale of the prevent duty and the two distinct ways, as outlined in the government's guidance, in which universities are called upon to enforce compliance with the duty. First, as you may know, concerns the vetting of external speakers and events to decide, prior to the speech or event taking place, whether the views that might be expressed run the risk of being extremists and therefore drawing people into terrorism or that they are views that are shared by terrorist groups. Again, I assume devotion to the Crown is not included in this category. Framed in terms of risk management, university authorities are told that if they do invite extremist speakers, they must ensure that they are, quote, challenged by opposing views at the same event. In making such decisions, universities are also exhorted to exercise extreme caution and be fully convinced that any risks of people being drawn into terrorism by such an event can be fully mitigated. As I want to argue later, dire warnings indeed when falling on the ears of risk averse managers and organisations. Now again, all this is predicated on that model of young adult protection, ostensibly preventing the now psychologised and infantilised vulnerable student subject from potential extremist grooming. The second element of the prevent duty concerns the vetting and surveillance of students themselves, similarly played out on the unstable axis of vulnerability and threat of future victim or potential terrorist. And this is where the problematic models of supposed cognitive or behavioural radicalisation come fully into play, because here staff are called upon to survey their students in order to report, quote, changes in behaviour and outlook. Some staff, indeed, are apparently to be trained to be able to recognise the designated signs in order to respond appropriately, which in essence means ultimately reporting people to the police or the channel programme, which is that part of Prevent which deals with young people. As has recently been reported, in the wake of the introduction of the Prevent duty, there has already been a considerable spike in the number of referrals to the channel programme. Now, such signs of alleged extremist deviance may therefore, therefore take behavioural form, people's actions, or cognitive form, the ideas or views they express. To the first will then be applied what, what we might call the government of the body. To the second, and I borrow here from Seamus Heaney via Tom Stockerty, the government of the tongue. If the advice given elsewhere is to be applied to universities, behavioural signs to be subject to scrutiny and governance might include, amongst other things, the, quote, sudden or unexpected adoption of religious forms of dress. Or, and again I quote, the unexpected growing of a beard. <laughs> uh, I, I assume this means it's unexpected to the observer. As to, do you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the views expressed, the views expressed now subject to the government of the tongue, could include someone who might, quote, complain, often with anger, about government policies, especially foreign policy, 
or that they, quote, might begin to believe in government conspiracies. Which I think covers almost all of my students. Although, of course, it doesn't. Because almost all of my students are white. And despite the protestations of the proponents of PREVENT, that they deal with all the children of radicalization equally, this issue is profoundly racialized. Duly trained university staff will also be expected to, quote, be able to recognize vulnerability to radicalization in their students. Again, if the sort of advice given to schools is to be extended to universities, what this is essentially includes is the rendering of innocuous, sometimes personally difficult circumstances, thoughts and feelings and behaviours as deviant and potentially dangerous. They are also often contradictory and can include, among other things, young people showing a desire for excitement and adventure, or a tendency to be isolated, having low self-esteem and introspectively ruminating on questions about faith, identity and belonging of wanting to fit into a group, or of falling out with a group, of adhering to strict religious practices, or showing a tendency towards rebellious transgressive behaviour. Indeed, indeed, one might also assume that the advice given to schools in this search for signs that children may display different signs or seek to hide their views is even more applicable to older students more practised in the art of deception and makes this search for radical <coughs> signification all the more fraught and Kafkaesque. Maybe it's the student who is displaying none of these signs and saying none of these things who is the truly hidden extremist. <laughs> the unheard, unseen, unknown radical threat, as Donald Rumsfeld might have put it. <laughs> So where did this conception of non-violent extremism and its imagined relationship to radicalisation come from? Why is it associated with an attack on intrinsically British values? And what has this got to do with universities anyway? The focus on non-violent extremism was trailed by David Cameron in his 2011 Munich speech, where the link with an integrationist agenda was all too evident. The problem of radicalisation was laid firmly at the door of self-segregating communities. Muslim youth alienation was seen to be rooted in a loss of a sense of belonging and ultimately the failure of what was termed state multiculturalism. The answer was the very evocation of British values evident in the recent Prevent Guidance and the promotion of what Cameron termed muscular liberalism, which he contrasted with the supposedly limp and impotent arguments of what was interestingly now called not the hard, but the soft left. Cameron's attack on state multiculturalism, from which the logic of the prevent duty emerged, had a much longer lineage. It was, as one commentator noted, the result of the pernicious influence of a neoconservative faction within the Conservative Party, seeking to refigure, reconfigure the rationale and focus of counter-terror policy and signalled that Michael Gove has won. As the leading neoconservative at the heart of government policy making in recent years, Gove has indeed been influential in framing the logic that underpins the current prevent duty. A stout advocate of using force to intervene abroad, domestically the world has similarly been cast as a mansion struggle between extremism or totalitarianism on the one hand, and British values muscular liberalism and the open society on the other. It's not by chance that at the height of the storm around the Trojan Horse scandal, it was to Karl Popper's tolerance paradox that Gove turned to defend his call to drain the swamp and deny the public square to views inimical, inimicable, that word, uh, to liberal values. <laughs> Hardly surprising either, and certainly not unconnected, that Gove is also now at the forefront of the campaign to leave Europe, which for the right at least has long been a barely sublimated euphemism for its antagonism toward migration. The management of, my, of migration, migrants and migrant communities is embedded, is embedded in discussions of Britishness. And again, as Aaron Kurnani has argued, 
the movement of an integrationist model of Britishness from the fringes of the extreme right in the Thatcherite era through to, uh, through to the centre ground of British politics in the shadow of the war on terror has been key in forging the models of radicalisation we have today. In all this pronounced identification of a certain conception of liberal values as quintessentially British, there is, I think, an exemplar of what Paul Gilroy has referred to as post-colonial melancholia, a social, cultural and psychological blockage that, as he puts it, is the after effect of imperial domination and that today prevents the development of a durable, habitable multiculture. The same sunset-hued light of imperial nostalgia in which sections of the far right tend to be. As Gilroy further argues, the sustained onslaught on multiculturalism in the wake of 9-11 has always been based on the erroneous assumption that solidarity and diversity cannot coexist. And it, and it is this that has given the impetus, as he puts it, toward a wholesale re-evaluation of the tarnished notion of Britishness. The result, he insists, is the militarisation of everyday life as a defining feature of our time that relies in large part on the insistence that we, quote, must now become fundamentally and decisively the same. It is a process which also sees the securitisation of civil institutions so that citizens increasingly become not only the object of surveillance but its means. It's also perhaps telling of the times in which we live that Gilroy's, marks that I've just, Gil, Gil, Gilroy's remarks, which I've just referred to, uh, were given during his inaugural lecture at the London School of Economics, one of those campuses identified in 2010 as a breeding ground of extremism by Douglas Murray, then head of the now defunct neocon think tank, the Centre for Social Cohesion. Since 2011, however, Murray has been the associate director of another prominent neoconservative think tank, the Henry Jackson Society, which, along with its close affiliate organisation, Student Rights, has been at the forefront of the campaign targeting universities as supposed sites of radicalisation. Michael Gove, a newly noted in passing, is one of the illustrious signatories to the Henry Jackson Society's statements, statement of principles. Indeed, the idea that universities have been sites of radicalisation has long exercised the minds, not to say the spleen, of conservative and neoconservative think tanks. One might wonder where they gain inspiration for understanding radicalisation as the work of social networks of dedicated activists or a cabal of ideologues attempting to recast the world according to their own narrow understanding of its moral order. Perhaps it's because they gaze into a mirror. <laughs> Certainly, the neoconservative clique, uh, this neoconservative clique, has been central in targeting universities as ungoverned spaces, breeding extremism, and so in need of regulation, control, and surveillance. But when the Home Affairs Committee examined the roots of extremism in 2012, it was the Henry Jackson Society that provided much of the evidence purporting to demonstrate that universities were particularly prone to Islamist efforts to radicalise and recruit. The committee found, however, that there was, quote, seldom concrete evidence to confirm that universities excuse me, were where people were radicalised, and that, quote, the emphasis on the role of universities by government departments as sites of radicalisation was disproportionate. Despite this, however, the same committee went, then went on to complain that some universities may have been complacent in challenging extremists and recommended the issuing of further guidance as to their role, helping to provide the very ground we stand on now. That's something gleefully picked up on in a recent Student Rights Henry Jackson Society report published last year called Preventing Prevent, without of course them noting the committee's conclusions that contested their own findings. Now in similar vein, and in a splendidly circular argument, the same Preventing Prevent report contends that student complaints about the nature of the prevent duty, 
that it is racist, targets Muslims as a suspect community, prevents free speech, stigmatizes vulnerable people, and calls on lecturers to spy on students, which summarizes things quite well, I think, that these things themselves, uh, so the report says, uh, become evidence of the insidious influence of extremist narratives and extremist groups on students. In other words, and again, demonstrating a perverse logic, Orwell would, Orwell would have well recognized, voicing such criticism is itself now construed as evidence of extremism, or of people being influenced by extremism, and therefore, perhaps, of being drawn into terrorism. But surely the robustness of the culture of universities, havens of critical inquiry, and stout defenders of the principle of free speech will be more than a match for this assault on unfettered learning in the name of clamping down on ungoverned spaces. Now we have witnessed, happily, many voices raised from within university hierarchies expressing just such a position. The new Vice-Chancellor of Oxford University, no less, Professor Louise Richardson, has called on universities to allow the airing of what she calls objectionable ideas so that students can develop the capacity to frame a response. And she should know. As well as being a long time expert on what terrorists want, or so at any rate the title of her book on the subject claims, as an undergraduate many years ago in Trinity College Dublin, along with a friend, she was, she claims, recruited by the, and I quote, student branch of the IRA. <laughs> The surely infamous, infamous and much feared Trinity College wing of the provisional movement. <laughs> Although thankfully, uh, she, she managed to resist actually joining uh, while her friend did. The fledgling VC, and I quote, remained in the background, and I quote directly, making sandwiches in the kitchen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, more seriously, however, implicated in this debate too is the changing place, role and ethos of the university. And whether trends in its changing nature are likely to enhance or undermine its capacity to resist the challenge offered by the prevent duty. There is plenty here about which to be concerned. For those of us working and learning in higher education, the paradox noted earlier where the governance of schools reformed in the name of liberalisation witnesses an ever greater encroachment of state regulation in the everyday lives of the young has parallels far closer to home. So too, the apparent paradox of the shape and purpose of higher education being driven by the deregulation of markets, even as simultaneously the, the university is targeted as a prime ungoverned space requiring governance and control is resolved if we understand that the transformation of universities as civic spaces into privatised financial concerns is one in which thought is to be compelled, policed and governed by the logic of neoliberalism and the market itself. In so many spheres we see, all too clearly, evidence of the growing domination of managerialism over aspects of university life and the deprofessionalization of our profession in the name of professionalism. As has recently been argued, management in the neoliberal university is characterized by the combination of free market rhetoric alongside intensive managerial control practices. Establishing the end of the contemporary university, as one colleague once told me, without even a hint of critique, concern or irony, to be the pursuit of what he called market-led academic freedom. An echo of the market democracy to be found beyond the bounds of the academy. More immediately, the very form of the preventuary, its institutional and bureaucratic order, the generation of patterns of rules, procedures, screening and assessment tools, techniques and regulatory benchmarks, performs an important ideological function, giving a sheen of scientific rationality to a set of practices that is anything but an acclaim to predictive power based on little, if any, empirical grounding. And such bureaucratic and regulatory forms chime all too well with the audit culture 
and measurability obsessed new managerialism of the contemporary neoliberal university. As a political project and system of values reflecting the radical shifts in contemporary capitalism, neoliberalism finds its organisational arm in this new managerialism as a mode of governance now ex extended to the public service realm and the provisions of health and education. Its key features include, among other things, monitoring regimes designed also to encourage self-monitoring, as has been argued through the widespread use of performance indicators, rankings, league tables and performance management. And it's just such a culture of monitoring and self-discipline that is mirrored in the prevent duty provisions, where the performance indicators in question are now the indices of expressive non-radicalisation. And staff, and even more so students, particularly Muslim students, are compelled, in this sense, to perform non-extremism. For the neoliberal university, any allied social, political and moral dilemmas are similarly reduced to managerialist issues of governance and regulation. Indeed, I think there's even a link here too, if more diffuse, with that integrationist vision of Britishness. In the alienating, atomizing state of flux that is the world of homo economicus, uh, a nostalgia-hued sense of Britishness provides a soothing balm and mirage of fixity in time and space. The very insecurities that give rise to the cultural backlash of insisted upon homogeneity are paradoxically the product of those very forces of neoliberalism that forged just such a need. More specifically, we might also point to the manner in which the logic of the market is manifest in regimes of target setting and the attraction of research income as an end in itself. A logic that coalesces happily with the generation of service research where again, a priori assumptions and built-in conclusions align with and underwrite government policies, not least in theorising and developing models of radicalisation, stupefying the capacity of universities to be sites of opposition. In that regard, no one should be particularly surprised that universities have become the site of, sur of the surveillance and discipline of ideas in the name of countering terror and extremism given the central role that academics have played in inventing those very terms as ways of setting constraining limits to thought. I think it's worth remembering too that while the focus of the prevent duty is on events featuring external speakers and the surveillance of students, the risk calculus is also to extend to off-campus events which are in any way affiliated with, funded or branded by the university. For the, university as business manage, uh, for the university as business, managing the brand and risk to reputational capital becomes a central concern. As a model of risk management, in many ways, the prevent duty mirrors trends in managerial strategies adopted in today's university, not least in the increasingly bureaucratized ethical scrutiny of social research. Where we, have all, where, we, where we have also seen that such risk management has a colonising tendency. Martin Hammersley has argued that the ethical regulation and governance of research has witnessed considerable mission creep in recent years and in a very particular direction. Predicated on an expanding conception of minimising risks and claiming predictive powers unsuited to the nature of social research, the drift from ethical judgement to monitoring regimes, again, evidences, evidences a process of deprofessionalization. It's also one where the concept of reputation has become a powerful and corrosive organizing principle. One recent study in sociology examined evidence that UK university research ethics committees can be used to, quote, restrict research that could be embarrassing for the institution or where university managers use them as mechanisms for internal discipline, including instances where research on terrorism and extremism was involved. Indeed, central here, it is argued, has been the mutation of risk management to reputation management, and embedding ethics procedures within the increasingly managerial structure of the university, 
leaving them open to pursuit of market-defined institutional interest. In this, we may be following the model previously experienced in US universities, longer accustomed to the vagaries of marketization, where there has been a pattern of deploying research ethics processes and oversights, oversight as, quote, a device to frustrate and deter potential threats to an institution's reputation. In such ways, the managers of a neoliberal university can silence again by deploying a subverted discourse of protection. The language of reputation become, can become the mask of compliance and censorship. Now, this is not to say that there aren't important ethical issues here for academics and other professionals being called upon to comply with the prevent duty, just that they're unlikely to be the ones most widely heard. One dissenting voice uh, in this regard is that of the critical psychiatrist Derek Summerfield, who recently called upon the General Medical Council, deafening in their silence on the matter, to condemn the mandatory attendance of NHS staff, including mental health practitioners, at prevent awareness workshops. Not only, Summerfield argues, because the prevent duty represents a modern day McCarthyite regime of spying and scapegoating, but wrong too, as he puts it because, it, because it is a corrosion of the ethics of the doctor-patient relationship, designed to prime doctors and others for an activity which is, dupli which is duplicitous deviation from their medical responsibilities. These medical ethical issues were particularly acute for psychiatrists, Summerfield argues, because their practice is designed, because the practice of psychiatrists is designed to give them particular access to a person's intimate thoughts and perceptions. And we might, and just as we might say, likewise for academics, in positions to invite students to discuss their views and perspectives on, say, the contentious politics of Palestine, or the ethics of violence, or the nature of terrorism. How are we, or even more so, how is the student to function honestly in this now over-governed space? Even looked at another way. If in a debate on the state's use of torture, someone makes an argument for the validity of the ticking bomb scenario, should I adjudge this contrary to the values of freedom and democracy and the international human rights-based prohibition of torture? If they argue in support of the illegal war in Iraq, to whom should I report this evidence of extremism? In several ways then, there, is, there has to be grave concern about the trajectory of the university as market-focused business engaged in the production of service research operating in the chilling atmosphere of prevent duty compliance. In a sort of pale imitation of the calculated offsetting of political risk that characterizes the new Western forms of remote control warfare, the nexus of risk-averse managerialism and the deployment of research ethics procedures as a tool of market-focused reputation management will likely create considerable barriers, if not confound, the capacity for critical research and inquiry into issues of political violence, terrorism and extremism. Precisely the sort of research, I would suggest, that absolutely needs to be done and the contribution to the public good of the university as a site of civility rather than a culture of compliance should be embracing. And that's me.
Um, it's not even post-colonial Nabokoa yet. It's actual colonial discourse. Mm. Um, if you think about the radicalization that Gudani speaks about, all that language of union, all that language of care, which turns into, as soon as the non radicalization happens, like the most abusive parent you can imagine in terms of the state. But I just want to think a little bit about the position that not just us, but many public sector have been put into in relation to being, becoming racist spies. Also imagine that once we've done this spying, that we trust who we've been spying for to have a duty of care to those who are now, who are now under their watch. And so I want you just to maybe think a bit about the relationship between this, so they say, toxic mess, and the reality of what happens to suspects in this suspect community um, when they are under the care of the state um, in relation to that half devil and half child, so half child until radicalisation um, and then half devil. So just, it, it, do we need to think more about talking about Belmars, talking about what happens to those people once they are in the state? It's a question. What was it? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just very, very funny yeah. this comment. No. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with you completely. It is a toxic mix. And I think the thing um, the thing that I wanted to draw out a lot more was precisely that kind of focus on Britishness. Because it's almost kind of taken for red. It's just it's just in there that it keeps being said, British values, British values. You know, um, and I'm always reminded whenever we talk about that, about you know, Mahatma Gandhi, when he, was, when he was asked, what does he think about British democracy? And he said, I think it would be a very good idea. Uh, these values aren't British, actually. They don't belong to anybody. They belong to anybody. They belong to all of us. And certainly they don't belong to a culture which, could, which, has, which has all of those qualities potentially too, but also has performed them you know, in the exact opposite uh, ways. And it's, that, it's the fact of that becoming the basis of everything, that that's, that's the, bears the bottom line. And as I say, this equation then, with, which I think is really striking in, in the practice that's already happened in schools, where, you know, where this idea of teaching British values is, is now central to the curriculum, where if they don't, if they're not seen to be teaching those values as British values in a particular way, that's extremism. Now, th that step across there is, is is extremely powerful, and it's very and it's silencing. I mean, the real the real thing here. I mean, you're right to point out the people who are going to be caught in this web. Um, the real effect that worries me most, I suppose, is just is the fact that we won't even for an awful lot of people we won't even get there because they'll all, they'll have already censored themselves. Which is not to say that attitudes or positions or views disappear. They're just not spoken. Or they're not spoken in certain contexts, in certain environments. And they become silence, uh, silence areas in the public realm that become all the more potentially problematic, actually, um, elsewhere when they're spoken of. Do you know what I mean? But no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, yeah, the, the duty of care will be, well, what? Well, it, it'll be more enhanced ways in which people now have to perform non extremism. But performing non-extremism actually isn't non-extremism. It's just performing it. You know, in the same way that we sometimes say our universities are really good places to come and learn. <laughs> okay. They are, obviously. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> we have horrible neoliberal, vacuous people spouting nonsense. You all have hundreds of questions. I know we all agree with them, but come on, it's something I should say. Right? <laughs> What happens to students, non-British students, international students in this situation? And who become suspect then? How does this perhaps contradict with an economy of uh, the British university who relies as well on international students? Uh, uh, well, you, 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 we, can, we can imagine what's going to happen with that, can't we? It's like, it's, it'll be, it, it'll be, it'll, it'll revolve it, because it'll still be about bringing uh, international students in, but it'll be about policing them even more closely. It'll be monitoring very closely. I mean, it has to be. It's going to be, isn't it? I mean, it's inevitable uh, in, in terms of the way in which it's constructed even now. Um, I, I don't think it'll prevent international because, as you say, the, the market logic is going to be there. The security logic is going to be, yeah, bring them in, really please them, really watch them, because they're the ones you really need to watch out for, isn't it? Okay. No, but, but, but it's, but it's in, I think it's actually kind of like, the inevitable consequence of the way in which it's been set up. Because if you've got somebody, I mean, let's imagine for a moment, who are going to be trained to look for the signs of vulnerability 
It'll, it'll be people probably, it won't even be academics half as much, it'll be people with HR backgrounds and it'll be functionaries within the university. That's what I think will happen. And they will have certain, you know, targets to meet. Now, how many, how many vulnerable people who are vulnerable to radicalisation have you spotted this week? Uh, you know, they'll, they'll have targets and it will be metrically organised and it will be auditable and, and top part, part of that list will include people coming from certain places. I mean, it just will, won't it? They might not say it. That language won't be the way they'll say it, but there'll be a way of categorising things in, in that way to, in, to ensure that that surveillance happens. Don't you think? Yeah, I just want to add to what you just said. And thank you, it was really interesting. I'm, I'm originally from Colombia, so uh, this is quite, um, quite unusual yeah. where I come from. Um, as far as whether that will happen, will happen, it's actually, it's actually happening already, as we know. Um, I actually came across an HR person who, um, you know, when we may name this, but she did say that um, it was advisable for Chinese and foreign students not to demonstrate mm. because they might lose their visa. Mm. Now I know we've known that for some years, but I mean that's already happening. Mm. And the other uh, short um, comment, it's not a question, it's a comment, uh, that I wanted to make is that uh, amongst the Colombia Solidarity groups that I've worked with, we have already found out that the complementary to this, the complementary tool, which is the IT and the internet, mm. is already being censored. And I know, I mean, it has been censored unknowingly by the NSA anyway. But we've already come across evidence that even academic websites are being censored. Mm. And we can't access the information. I mean, not by all ISPs. Mm. And I'm afraid I've just been made so angry by this that I approached a couple of ISPs. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, we, we do need to look into this, but we can't help it because we get lists and they're applied somewhere technologically. Just because these websites have names like, you know, conflict in or terror or whatever, mm. the words. I mean, these are not websites which are inciting to terror. They're actually academic websites mm. and we can't get in it. Mm. I mean, it's actually quite serious. Mm. So, yes, I mean, mm. I think if we're already there. <coughs> And this is just going to make it worse. I think you're, yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. And, and if, you know, I think the thing about for an awful lot of people, uh, you, as you say, kind of HR managers and whatever. And you know, for those of us vaguely interested in this stuff, um, you know, you can you, you come at it from a critical point of view. For an awful lot of people, you, you just say the word terrorism, and it's like that's enough. That's it. That's that's it. that'll do it. That'll do it. There you go. Right. What in God's name do they want to look at that stuff for anyway? Do you know what I mean? And and I think that's that. As I say, the bureaucratic character of what we're, we're, we're going to look at will be, as more, will be as powerful as any kind of ill intent on any individual. Because that's what we know, is how the process works in the university today, isn't it? You know, it kind of has a machinery that begins to happen. And that machinery without clear bounded rules, and it won't have clear bounded rules because for all the kind of talk about it, 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 will, it will be risk averse first. And the risk calculus I think will always lend itself to saying, let's err on the side of caution. And that erring on the side of caution keeps moving the space along. Do you know what I mean? That's my word, I guess. Um, I mean, that and whether or not I ever can go on and send final question. Um, sort of following on from that, so we've heard different people speak in this series, some of whom are kind of endorsers of the status quo, to say the least. And they speak a completely different language to you and to people who agree with you. I agree with every word you said. Um, I wonder how you would talk to them. I, I don't know that they would understand <laughs> what you would say. I mean, literally, they speak a different language. And, and you know, we've all struggled, a lot for people here, to communicate with them, to get through to them, to make them see their contradictions, etc., etc. Um, I feel like you were watching my last annual assessment. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but on a serious note, how do you think we should try to talk to the people, vice chancellors, uh, managers, the government, people who um, are speaking a language that isn't yeah. critical, that, that is Orwellian, is using terms like social cohesion, you know, 
and whatever. The, the amount of contradictions are just so glaring. It's, it's well, even if they can't hear, you, you have to still say what it is you need to say. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and you can't also um, not say it precisely, which is to also accuse them. And that's the real thing. You're right because you're basically pointing to university managers and saying you're actually everything you do is part of the problem. But what else are you going to do? So we should call them racist spies. Oh, I'm happily, happily called um, uh, racist. Well, but, or, but, oh, or trying to make us racist. Trying to make us yeah. Um, and yeah, they're racist overlords. I don't think it's, 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 it's also, <laughs> yeah. it's also, again, it's, it's the individuals are almost kind of, um, they're enacting sets of structures. Do you know what I mean? Um, I, you, you can only say what, even if they don't hear, you can only say what is the case. And the real, as I say, the real worry for me is that the, the, the kind of the, the two things coming together about the way in which the government's trying to deal with this specific or constitute the particular issue just fits in far too well, actually, with the very logic that it is the university increasing today. We can only point that out, and and, I, and the union have a huge role in playing this. And I mean, you know, it really it does. It's your fault. Uh, no, it, it it does though, because what well, what other institutional form do we have other than that? Our profession. You know. hmm? Our profession. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, had a, I had a question here, I've got a couple more. Please, sir. Um, unfortunately, yeah. well, we were focused on the student's charge and the level of that it uses and how successful you think it will be in combating terrorism. Uh, how successful at combating terrorism? And, yeah, and what you and how severe you think the level of sustainability is on with the student's charge. Well, they're going to be. Pretty significant, aren't they? I mean, like, I mean, no, I, mean, I haven't looked in, in detail at, at, at precisely the provisions of it, but every, all, all, exp all experience again of these things suggests that every time somebody says there's going to be these limits to it and the barriers are going to be here and, and, and everything else, that's not what happens. You know, all, all of our experience suggests that whenever you get the provision of these kinds of powers, there's a kind of, at a, a, a one level, actually, an understandable logic of mission creep within the, within police force and everything else, who again are risk averse. Uh, institutions who basically look and go, well, the next time, what's the first thing that happens as soon as something does actually happen? Is everybody goes, well, why didn't you do something about it? And so everything suggests that all of those organisations and institutions that have the possibility of a power that can be broadened outward and which is subject to scrutiny, but that scrutiny itself becomes part of the institutional order of the way in which things will be looked at, that everybody starts to uh, be complicit. In, in saying, well, the worst thing that can possibly happen is that thing that must be avoided, and all of the things that need to be done short of that must therefore be done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that worst thing is another bomb. And the, the drift is always in that direction, it seems to me. But I'm particularly miserable in these parts. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, it's less of a question than just um, to thank you for pulling starting to pull apart some of those indicators uh, which have suggested that people look for because, I mean, some of them are very contradictory but also kind of go directly against some of the human rights and UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, such as Article 15, the whole autonomous organisation, you know, and um, I think just in terms of those transitions into adult and actually wanting to gain more autonomy and break the ties with family and the ideological, you know, sort of vision of what a community should be, the security of community. You know, so I think maybe we can do a bit more of that unpicking of the indicators and showing the contradictions um, in terms of what we should expect young people to want to do and challenge yeah. in, in their transitions to adulthood and actually really get evidence which which shows those contradictions. Absolutely. No, you're, you're, I'm fascinated because I've just got something to do that, not in oh, this right. country, but in EPA through the form. And I want to do just that to so right. actually look at those kind of contradictions between transitions into adulthood and what young people are navigating. Yeah. Do you know in terms of policy and kind of these visions of what extremism yeah. is, looks like to policymakers? 
Yeah, and, and you know, the, the thing, thing about indicators is really, I think, is very, very important because, because again, it's, it's an attempt to kind of manage risk where it's all about a fantasy. It's fantasy. Fantasy. Uh, you know, how many times do we, again, you know, you know, three girls go to Syria. News reports say you couldn't have told they were, they were really clever, they fitted in really well. You know. In other words, every single indicator which just apparently has been able to alert you to this problem, didn't exist. Well, that's because they don't work. I've got news for you, do you know what I mean? I mean, that's the point where any half-decent social scientist sits back and goes, well, clearly the model I've been working with, the paradigm that, I'm, uh, that I've come up with, doesn't make any sense. I'd better look for something else. But that's not what happens. Everyone just goes, Oh well, let's just find another set of. Let's look for the other contradictions of the of, of them. It must be the kids who fit in really well. Then. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? I mean logically, that's the way you go, isn't it? So they don't. They, they, they are a fantasy. They genuinely are. They're a fantasy. To my mind, you know. Yeah. Uh, Katie. Yeah. Um, I really like to look at this. Yeah. Um, I think it's quite Don't do it. Uh, number one, in terms of us, in terms of academics, don't do it. Don't don't uh, conform to it. Don't involve yourself in it. Don't provide any information. Don't do it. Make it very clear to your students beforehand if that's the case. Um, I you know I teach stuff about ter about terrorism. And as I said, actually most of my students are white, and, and therefore actually, you know what? Most of them don't have anything to worry about at one level. You know what I mean? Uh, might not. Have, but but you have to be very clear. Nothing is going to get reported. He believe in that, and you say, oh, and he puts in everyone's mind. Well, what does it mean about it? What's that all about? Do you know what I mean? It can only be non-compliance on our part. And students, I mean, you, you can only act collectively and personally in not doing it. That's a very poor answer. Okay. I've never been very good as an activist, as you can tell. <laughs> Policing of the university and this uh, this clampdown and extremism and stuff just only gonna get worse, and it will never ever end. It will just continue until it reaches ridiculous levels. Well, it, it, well, one one way in which it could, at least in this narrow sense, end is to not have the prevention. You know, it, it is actually a law that's now been introduced, and there is the capacity to say, let's not have that law. Let's get rid of that law. And let's not do that. Now, that doesn't get rid of the wider issues and problems. But you know, the Snoopers Charter is just pointed out. You know, we have this new law which gives these powers over to organisations. Let's not give those powers over to those organisations. Do you know what I mean? There is a capacity to act in relation to the, the law, legal changes that are happening. And the obvious thing to do, if the prevent duty box here, uh, is to argue very, very vociferously that it should end. It doesn't resolve all of our problems. It doesn't resolve all of our issues. And the worry would even be then that you know, within universities, such is their nature, that once these things become something that they start to do, they set systems up, you know, reporting systems. Uh, you know, we, we've noticed the vulnerability of this student, and if this goes over to the people who are charged with, you know, student support, and you get systems in place, but you combat those systems. You, you, you refuse to, to engage with them. Okay, Bob. Brothers and sisters. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose I want to think a bit more about this business of refusing to engage with these things. I, I, I suspect it's more difficult even than that. Um, I mean, here's a practical example. Um, you, you can use all sorts of weapons. You can point out this is logical, inconsistent, cretinous. You can point out the five definitions of the act. The present cabinet will lock itself up because there are a bunch of extremists. You can do all that and you can laugh. And laughing is good. But what do you do if you want to, for instance, hold a meeting in a university like this one? And you're told by management that you can't do it unless you go through a set of procedures. You can tell them to sod off. You're not going to do it. Or you can jump through the hoops and have the meeting. And it's certainly not clear to me which is. 
which is God. You go, given that people who, and I don't mean this generally, but academics are heaven who actually object to this whole prevent subject, they're in a tiny minority. Most academics in this institution, like any other, quite happy to go along with all this rubbish. So, what do those of us who are against it most useful do? Now, it's not that I'm not going to answer that question. But it seems to me that one of the things we, we might go away from this week is that sort of question. Because I, I think if we approach it in an ad hoc position, we're not likely to get very far. And although I agree with you that you know, the first recourse is the union, given that the union represents its members, given most members support prevent, we're fine. So, what's to be done? Mm -hmm. Well, that's always the question, right? No. Yeah. Um, and you're right, look, you know, I'm not saying, I don't want the answer in, in, in that sense at all. And, and that is what we should go away from in that sense and say, well, what are the options here? What are the possibilities? And better arrive that collectively than, than individually, because either then, people individually get picked off in, in, in certain ways and uh, that they kind of start to try to do certain things and, and then look around and realize that they're the only ones in doing those things. Um, you know, what constitutes the basis upon which engagement is something that you can do? What, what, who, you're right, what hoops do you go through and what... And, and making the arguments in those contexts and stuff, you know, but I mean, I... I well, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, I mean, having listened to your talk, I'm beginning to think that I might start to find an answer to the question of what should the university be for? Uh, a place where we should be subversive, and subversive together with staff and students, and form um, alliances. Um, that's not a particularly profound thing to say, I guess, but uh, that's all I can think of at the moment. So when I give a lecture, for instance, I'm essentially being subversive. Uh, when one organises a meeting, one has to pretend that the meeting is about something else because otherwise one can't book the room. So one is being subversive. And one should encourage the youngsters, the students, to be subversive too and to become subversive academics and teachers and, and whatever. Um, I'm afraid that that won't be enough, but it might be some sort of start. So that's the answer to the question, what should the university be? A place where we are subversive together. And that's for contingent reasons that are very unfortunate, <coughs> which is where otherwise. Um, Trish? Yeah, um, I, have, I have a question for Mark, um, and I have just something to say about it, and he's raised my leg, but, um, and the question is, I'm going to start off with a, a, an observation now. Um, your paper was brilliant, it's tied together a whole pile of things, and in particular that coercive model of British integration tied together and connected some dots for me. But one thing we need to think about as well is why the prevent duty was made a statutory duty. And so a complicated history to it. But in a nutshell, it became so toxic in Muslim communities it could no longer be a voluntary or community-based program. So it's one thing we need to remember. They managed to do their bits and to defeat us. We're looking around and wondering how in God's name are we going to defeat this thing? And Bob, I think you're wrong here. No academic in the world supports prevent. They will sign on by and hold their nose in the air and whine about how horrible it is, but you won't get somebody to stand up for it. And here's an example. The University of Warwick, UCU, the academic union, has just passed a motion um, um, that they got their university management, Warwick is not about university management, to commit that they would do the legal minimum necessary to comply with prevent. And this was presented as some sort of massive win. You know, this is, this is the best we can do. It is absolutely not. We can defeat prevent. We're actually in a moment now, for the last maybe three or six months, every time prevent has hit the headlines, it is being, it's counterproductive, it's, it's creating a community of suspicion, it's divisive and so on. So in many, many ways, it is a toxic, which is good. That means some ideological legwork has been done. My question is, what's wrong with us that we haven't managed to take that further? And I think the union into this as well, but it's not only the union. Because to be honest, I think the, um, the profession, the part of our university communities that uh, 
um, you touched on is the student support and guidance. Um, they are the ones who will be given the training about, what did you call it, the government of the top. Yeah. They will be the ones who will be educating here the particular ridiculous, medieval, magical signs for how you notice somebody. As a profession, these people tend to be massively overworked, but also massively caring about their students. What they are also, though, is atomized. They're isolated. The big problem we have with the prevent legislation in universities is none of us know how it works. Mm -hmm. We need that collective response that, um, that Michael referred to. It can't be subvert. That would be shameful for us if I let sorry I was to support this piece of legislation. We need to defeat this. Mm -hmm. And it should not take that much. Our unionist policy to boycott us. Unison could have it pushed. But to tell you the truth, we shouldn't need the unions for this. Where's our pride as a profession? What other generation of university staff has actually had governments come onto campus and say, and the student movement here, we're quashing it. Shame on us if we've allowed ourselves to become an arm of the state in a period where the war on terror is itself either a, a thing of scorn or already a toxic name. There's, there's something absolutely wrong with us if we can't kick this piece of legislation out. To get it repealed is not an idealistic or romantic thing. It will just take a shot, just a shot, and we, universities, might be the place to go to it. The, the question I've lost on that, what